Hello? Could you hear me? Oh, I'm so happy to be here. So I'm Eric. I came from Brazil, the other side of the world. And actually, there is 36 degrees Celsius. And here is like minus nine. I'm really freezing right here. It's completely different for me. Today, I'm going to talk about Kubernetes and Docker and a lot of good stuff. But here, I'm not just, I'm not selling any technology. I'm just showing some experience that I've building and something that I've creating at home or at my job. So I work as a trainer and software architect in Brazil, work with financial companies and a lot of stuff. So first of all, who here has worked with Docker? Oh, there's a lot of people. And working with Docker Swarm in production. Oh, that is not so much, okay. And with Kubernetes. Oh, that is amazing. Okay, so this talk is focused on uh, real scenarios. We will talk a lot of, about a lot of things about Kubernetes and how to scale applications. We will talk a little bit about Node too because it's our context, but with this chips you can use in any application, in any scenario, just making this time configuration. I will show also some tools to improve your current cluster, your current cluster and help your uh, application. Okay, we are here because Node. So Node, we know that Node scales. Node are using in everywhere. We can use on Raspberry Pi, on servers, and everywhere. And when we, we think about Node, we think, oh, Node, that is incredible. We can use everywhere, yeah. But we know that scaling, the application scales, but we know that the word scale sometimes is, is confusing. Scaling applications is not that simple. We should think a little bit more, what is this scaling? I will show my opinion. All of this is based on my experience. And if you user agree, we can talk a little bit more later. Scaling for me is when you have your chaos or you have your application running and you should deploy new applications. You should deploy new versions and you should understand and monitor all of your applications. It's not just about copies. Here you have a lot of customers, a lot of consumers, and we should understand what our application is doing or not. So it's not just copies. We will talk a little bit more in how this uh, could run. And here, we are here to talk about Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is also called by Yay! So I spent a lot of time to make these animations. So yeah, I showed my mom, mom, see that? Yeah, this is amazing. So yeah, Kubernetes is, a, is our orchestrator. It's also called by Docker Captain. So it just manages your container, manage your applications to make some decisions, make health checks, understand how is the health of your application, and help to make something good. And in my opinion, one thing that is good that broke some fights is that they put soft engineers and SCREs to work together. Now the developers will create the manifest files, the SCRE will work together to monitor, to create the DevOps pipeline, and all of them is working in peace and working together. And Kubernetes, in my opinion, one of the best features is rolling updates. So it's the ability that we can run our updates on cluster without worries. We can make the updates granularly and update just a few pieces of our applications or microservices and we can check before this goes to production, just before the customer tries to access. Here I have the scenario. So I have a lot of consumers. They are accessing my Kubernetes. It's not actually accessing directly the Kubernetes. We have also like a pay gateway or something that is a layer, layer before going to Kubernetes. But in this case, I have a few versions of my API products. And I will deliver a new version, so I have the product on V2. So I'm updating this, this application, and the Kubernetes will make some health checks. They will ping in your application to see if it is safe or not to use. So here, I just finished the deploy. The Kubernetes will establish some connections, will ping in your, in your routes. They say, okay, I'm ready to receive requests. When I'm ready to receive requests, the Kubernetes will redirect all of new incomes to these new applications, and then we'll just remove the old version. Let's think about another scenario. In another scenario, we have also a deployment. We have the V3 right now. 
but this retreat is not safe. Maybe the, the database is wrong or maybe some connection, some third party uh, object is not working and then it's not working. But see, our infrastructure continues the same. The Kubernetes won't redirect other incomes to this wrong application and just kill the other version. So our, our infrastructure is safe and is running as planned. I'm gonna talk about the components. So Kubernetes, when you look at the documentation, we have a lot of lists, a lot of concepts, a lot of topics to understand. But here I brought something that you, maybe you usually do in your home or when you think to move to Kubernetes, you should use these components. So first I will talk about pods. Pods is the smallest unit of our code. We can have more than one application in, in each pod, but it's not recommended. It's not recommended. You can use only, uh, you can put your application right there, your Docker image, you can have your uh, database as well, but they are not uh, smart. So they, they need someone to control them. So we're gonna talk now about deployment. So deployment will specify how many replicas, how many copies we will have of this project. What is the limit? How many memory or CPU your application would use? Or version, so I can deploy the version one and version two at the same time, but I can expose this data for a different way. And how I will update this project or how I will share and expose to my, cons my consumers. For database, we usually use stateful set. Whereas uh, uh, deployment files is stateless, the stateful set could just persist data storage. We can use unique net network identifiers and we can make everything order. We can, uh, we have like graceful deletions. I don't remember the, the word, but we can delete all of the instances in order as well. So it's so much powerful to database to something that you want to store data. Okay, we have deployment and we have stateful sets. And now we want to expose, we want to establish a connection through your uh, infrastructure. And here we have the service. So the service is the goal is to expose your systems to the world. It's, it's also a load balancer if you configure. But here I'm exposing only the pod, only the application on version one. I will only make a, a load balancer. I have other, other types of services too inside the Kubernetes cluster. I can say, oh, this application is running on, per, on port 3000, so we'll expose on this port, and now we can have like an alias. When I call this name, they will redirect to deployment. For a stateful set, it's the same idea. It's the same target, same labels. It doesn't change so much. But when my application tries to access the stateful set, the database, it has to access the server, and the service will route you for the current uh, instance. So if you want more replicas or more instances of the database, you just put there and the service will understand what they have to do. And this is amazing. Okay, we have service, we have deployment, and all of them are running inside a node. So the node is just the VM properly, in the VM, we have the networking. The networking is the port forwarding, understanding inside the, the, the cluster is how they understand and the responsible for our servers communicate itself. We have the kubelet. The kubelet, they analyze the manifest file to see if it, or your application is running as planned, like limits, uh, copies, or everything that you make it on your manifest file the kubelet we run. And we have also the container runtime. We, we are talking about Docker, but we have other container runtimes as well that you can run inside the Kubernetes as well. Okay, we have nodes that is all VMs connected and we have the master. So the master will choose and we make some decisions about your cluster. So we have the cluster store that we manage and store all information about the cluster. We have the scheduler, when we have a new pod we have to, to send this new pod to an, a node and understand what is uh, going on or if a node is right or not to receive. We have a few controllers as well. We have node controllers to know if the node is safe 
we have replication controller to see if the copies and the amounts of instance is correct. And we have also the API server that we use as a front end that we use to perform operations on the control plane of the whole Kubernetes. When we run a command on the Kubernetes, we will run inside the API server. But well, let's see how the master or how is the behavior of Kubernetes compared to other approach. So here we will define a master, a master manifest config file that would be JSON or YAML file. We will have defined like we have a desired state. My desire is three instance. Okay, I will run three instances. So I have two in Canada and I have one in Brazil. Okay, my current state is exactly the same than my desired state. But imagine for somehow the, the server in Brazil is not responding. So the Kubernetes will make some checkings and we will schedule a new, uh, a new instance to other node. We'll make some checkings and now the node in Canada will receive the missing pod and I will have the same idea in the same go. Okay, when you use Kubernetes, we know that nothing is bulletproof. We know that sometimes using just Docker Compose or just using our property VM itself would help. And now let's talk about why it's good. So my opinion, zero downtime updates, when you can test, when you can check your application before exposing to your customers, you can replace and you can put a new instance with no worries. Yeah, actually your consumer is not uh, knowing what is going on. You just uh, switch your code, you can use canary deployments in a lot of microservices, fun steps. We can use multi-region clusters, we can use Raspberry Pi, we can use Linux servers, we can use everywhere in the world, just join uh, the VM on the clusters, so this is so amazing. And this is something that you should think about your application. So you have only one API. Your API is not, you are not deploying every time. So maybe Kubernetes is not so good for you because you have so much effort to create infrastructure and you are not using all of the benefits. So if you have a lot of APIs or you should have more than one instance, so you have to, to, to provide 24 hours up over, over infrastructure, maybe Kubernetes will help you more. And this is some polemic, no vendor looking, but when you go to some cloud platform, when you go Azure, AWS, Google, we have the same manifest file, but sometimes the configuration would be different. This is, uh, uh, when you use the manifest file, it's the same language, the same idea, the same attributes, but when we talk about the external services such as storage or other thing that you must use on a specific cloud, this would be different. Okay, why Kubernetes? Why, we, we are actually using other stuff here. We are just making our production, our deployment pipeline, and maybe why should we change or should consider using that? So how many of you using Docker Compose in production? Oh, Docker Compose. So Docker Compose is amazing. We can use, like I've been using you with Portainer. If something goes wrong, I just click there, we start and everything's okay. But when we think about scale with Docker Compose, we should enter and make everything manually. So it's not, it's not so smart than other approach. So if your application dies, you can make like an alert, send you an alert and you go there and replace or restart. And we have Docker Swarm. So Docker Swarm is the same idea than, than Kubernetes. The, the Docker Swarm is so similar than Kubernetes as well, but it's, it works only on the container runtime of the Docker. And if you want support, you go to the Docker Enterprise. But at the same time, the Kubernetes is a little bit uh, more powerful technically. So it provides che health checking provisions uh, the, inside the pod level. So we can use uh, scheduling and scaling, namespace and role based access. So you can create like manifest files to say what is application will run inside the Kubernetes uh, a little bit. And this is my scenario. So at my company and some customers, they are actually using uh, ACS or, AC or ECS in production. What is the difference here? The difference here is you have now the dependency of the third party 
and like in ACS, you are dependent on um, AC2 uh, VM. So if you want to scale more, you have a little time to up a new VM and configure sometime and uh, put this up. But all of this, you should use AWS or Azure or Google platform. So you should learn more about the specific version of your uh, Go. So, got a hack. How do we start? This gift is amazing. Oh, hackers, oh, this is amazing. Got a hack. How do we start? So we can start from a lot of places. First of all, I love this gift, yeah. I'm the bad guy, oh yeah. We can start with Cube ADM, going to on-prem solutions you can install on your VM, you can install on Raspberry Pi, on, on whenever you want. But you have to configure networking, monitoring, the master node, you have to configure all of them by yourself. This is sometimes a little bit harder than going to another approach. You can go to a cloud solution provider. I put here just the cloud that I remember, but I know that there are a lot of Kubernetes services for outside. So I've been using uh, Azure and uh, AWS a lot in my job and my customers, and it works so fine. So they provide you the master, and you can just up and manage the nodes. So this is so much straightforward than configuring and managing the node, the master node. Okay, so. In developer, you can use Minikube. So I'm using here Minikube with VirtualBox. And I can run all of the configuration manifest files that I will use in production in my machine. Just to test how it will run. And to show the power of the Minikube, all of this presentation and demos were, were run using the Minikube. Before going to Minikube, KubeADM, or Cloud Solution, we should run a manifest file. So our manifest file first has to say, what is the kind? What is the component that we are creating? So in this case, it's deployment. Okay, what is the metadata? So how do you create this, this component? And then how many copies? How many replicas do you have? And you can see, you can show selectors. The selector is powerful for something that you have already on air, is running, and you, you want to replace this instance or you want to update this instance, use these uh, match labels. We have the template as well. So how the application will actually work or will actually create it inside your cluster. We can put the image pool secrets when we are using Docker registry, private Docker registry, and we put actually the container itself. So you can put environment variables, storage, and everything inside this file. Okay, I will run first the MongoDB because my requirement is to use MongoDB. I created and I will expose this MongoDB using the CLI. So I'm just, I can use CLI or I can use manifest files, but just for example reasons, I'm creating from CLI. Here I'm getting the plotting. That is fine, I will get the SVC, that is the service, and the MongoDB is right to run. After that, the MongoDB is, is correctly configured. I have the service, I have the pod, and now I will create my application that I created in this manifest file. And now I created, and then I will expose again. Again, I'm running on CLI, but I could run inside a file as well. Because I'm using Minikube, I will get the URL from Minikube, and they will expose a URL for me, and then I will just make a request to see if my application is responding and going to the MongoDB and get the result. So it looks like nice. So I just created one file and I run a few comments and my application is on there so fast. Let's talk about tooling. So we have a lot of things about Kubernetes that I really love. One of them is we, everything is pluggable. It's a plug and play. You just apply a pro, you, you just run kubectl apply in a file, and then you can see the result, the plugin, the plugins just sharing each other, understanding each other. We have Istio. So Istio is a service mesh that provides you a lot of tools to monitor your applications and to install in your cluster. And I will show some tools that comes when you start then. So here I'm just running the demo. I just copy paste from the website, but they install a lot of components for us. And if you will go 
to one of them, we can see uh, the Prometheus. The Prometheus is a monitoring uh, tool that we can run queries and see some uh, metrics from the, your Kubernetes service. So here I have a lot of metrics and a lot of data that comes from the, the Kubernetes. And here, I will just make the same, so I'm redirecting the request from my, my pod to my, my machine, and I will go to Grafana. So Grafana is the data visualization, so here is the demo from the Grafana as well, so you can get information for your disk, memory, create alerts, and install dashboards. This is so much powerful, and I just run a command, and then I have everything enhanced, so this is so powerful. We have Elm too, so the Helm is a package manager, it's our NPM for Kubernetes. So you can create a lot of stuff, a lot of packages, and we can use actually this stuff. So here I will try to find the Redis, actually the production Redis that is configured with cluster, is if configured if everything that I will want to run in production. And then I will install this Redis. I will install, they will show a lot of suggestions to test if my Redis is working or not. And here I have the password and everything that's just, I will copy paste just, just to see if it's working or not. And then I enter in my regs and I just ping to see if this message is okay. So with three commands, I have everything prepared to production. So if I just try to create the regs from myself, I have five or six files to configure, to create roles, and to create passwords for everywhere. So it's not so easy to make it enhance. And here we can create templates. So with templates, I will open just on VS Code. And we have the templates. So you can create like dynamic files and you can change these files just changing a little code. So here I have all of the dynamic part, all that I can reuse through the applications. And I have here the service, dynamic as well. So I can change only a few variables. And when I go to the values, I just put the value that I really want. Imagine that you have the same service in three different environments. You just change the values and you have the same environment working everywhere. The same, actually, is the same infrastructure running in different environments with different values. Okay, we are here to talk about scaling. No JS applications, no, I love that, yeah. So, we should talk about what is scaling. So, scale itself, what does it mean? So, scale, this is my opinion. Scale, again, is something that you can control the chaos, you can control all of your copies, you can uh, redirect your request when you need. So, if you need more instance, if you need to update any time, this, you are scaling your application. If you are worried to make a deploy like on midday, sometimes you are not scaling. This is my opinion, okay? And talking about Kubernetes, to scale your application, if you forgot everything here, just remember that part. This part, we have some useful configuration that makes some, that helps Kubernetes to, to run your cluster. So you have liveness and readiness probe. Who we'll never know about Liveness and Readiness Probe. Okay. Uh -huh. Liveness and Readiness Probe. So Kubernetes is not that smart. So you have to say, oh, here you have to ping this URL, and then if you respond during that time, then it's okay, then you can run or not. Otherwise, the Kubernetes will wait like 10 seconds, five seconds. We'll just say, oh, if your application doesn't crash in five seconds, maybe it's right, but sometimes it's not. It's just because you are not catching the exceptions. So here we have a lot of code too, but let's pay attention just readiness and liveness pro. So the readiness, you say to the cluster, oh, are you ready to receive requests? Okay, I'm ready to receive requests. So how many time I have to wait before the first request? Oh, I want two seconds, three seconds to establish connections, establish like third party connections. And then if it, this first request, spend more than two seconds, something goes wrong, you have to delete this instance because it's trash. So you up a new instance and you see the result. The liveness problem is something similar, but the difference is the Kubernetes is making a lot of health checkings in our cluster 
to understand if it's still running or not. So we have here, are you alive? In two seconds, three seconds. And here we have, how many times I will, I will wait for the first request? Two seconds, okay. I'll ha I will have the timeout seconds as well. Sometimes you have a problem with like intermi intermittent problems and you really don't know what's going on, but the Kubernetes making this have check, this is deleting your application and creating again, and you actually don't know what's going on. You just know because you see how many restarts or how many new replicas you have. And we have the pod outscaler. So this pod outscaler, you, you put measure, so Oh, I, you, this application can access 20 megabytes or 200 gigabytes to access something. Or it can access memory or other kind of thing. And you spend limits. So if my application reaches 50% then the value that I put there, I want three more instances, four more instances. And actually it, doesn't, it works super fine. And this is something that you could use on Black Friday. So you are receiving a lot of requests, okay Kubernetes, but more and more and more instances. But if I don't want more instances, just kill them all and then this is fine. So this is super nice. But okay, this is a lot of information I know. That's a lot of things on internet and a lot of things that we do actually on daily day. But let's just summarize everything in your mind. So. Docker Kubernetes is just someone that is a code. It's someone that will replace your application when they are not healthy, make a strategy or update your application when you need. You can do rolling updates, you can make strategies to, up, to update a new version, to test a new version. You can make load balancers just using services and making your target just choosing which application is the best for your customers. And if your application is not safe, if your application is not responding, you have automated rollbacks. So you can use everything inside the Kubernetes uh, with no worries. So all of this content, all of Docker things, and a lot of stuff that I've, I've been doing too, is already on my website. If you want to see more or if you want to talk more, send me a ping on, on Twitter too, that I, I, I really want to learn more with you. Okay, so thank you so much for having me. I'm super proud to be here. Here is the links if you want to take a picture. All the slides is right here. If you want to talk to me on Twitter or LinkedIn, I would be really grateful for you to talk and to learn more with you.